Greetings, Nicholas Sweetwater here. I'm joined today by a guy who is not only legendary, he's an ambassador, an ambassador for Gibson. In fact, he's the global ambassador for Gibson. It gives me great pleasure to introduce my dear old friend, the one, the only Slash. Thanks for joining us, hey. my friend. Hi. How are, you? How are you? I'm good, man. Like, like we were just discussing, all things considered, not too bad. How about yourself? Uh, you know, all things considered the same. I've um, been really busy. You know, if anything, this whole episode has afforded me uh, a lot of time to be creative. So it's been good. I'm in the studio now, actually. Oh, right. Okay. Now, are you working actually live with people or is it all, is it all virtual kind of thing? Um, I just, I do a lot of stuff on my own and then, you know, Todd will drive in from Vegas and put bass on everything and then... I'll send that out to everybody else. And then on occasion, we all get together and jam. We've done that a couple times over this this period. Cool. Now, have you found this like a useful time for writing? Has it started? That's what I was saying, yeah. I mean, it's, it's definitely uh, given me a lot of um, opportunity to write and to focus and, and to not be rushing out the door all the time. You know? gotcha. Even when <laughs> so, bells are ringing, yeah. So it's been good. You know, there's been a lot of good material that's come up through this. Gotcha, gotcha. Now, one of the things that I've always admired about you, and we've discussed in the past, is you're always jamming with folk and you're always stretching yourself. Have you found COVID's put a big damper on that kind of thing, like getting influence and inspiration off other people? Um, I mean, you know, all things considered, I actually have done some jamming, obviously with my guys, also with guns, and then also in some other configurations. So it's not as much as I normally do, but I still manage to do it, you know? Gotcha. And it's been an interesting experience in every in every case because everybody's got their, their own version of social distancing and blah, blah, blah. And uh, it's been an adventure for sure. <laughs> yeah, it is. And like yeah. you said, it's been, I mean, it's been seven months since we last spoke and here we still are. Gibson Brand Ambassador Global. How does it feel to have that title? Is that intimidating? It's, it's too, you know, I never would think about it except for the fact that you just said it and it is, it sounds intimidating and I, I don't, I, you know, when you say it and I'm really flattered that they, they, they bestowed me with that moniker, but I, it's not something that I'm really conscious of, you know, through my regular travails in life. <laughs> gotcha, <laughs> you know? gotcha. I mean, the thing is, like, it doesn't surprise me at all. I think you've earned it at the risk of being obsequious because you're not only have you been always with the company, but you're you're probably one of the most synonymous people on this planet with the Les Paul. Well, I definitely have been with the, with the company pretty much my entire professional career. And even prior to that, you know, I had Les Paul. Right. Um, and so, yeah. And, and, and then all things considered, when when Guns N' Roses did start to become recognized, on a global scale, I was playing a Les Paul, which a lot of people weren't doing at the time. So I guess I am synonymous with a Les Paul, yeah. Now, and what particularly attracts you to the Les Paul, aside from the obvious things? Um, well, I mean, when I first started really, uh, you know, I, it takes me back to when I was a little kid living with my parents and I started recognizing certain sounds as being cool. Uh, the the pr premier one, was uh, Zeppelin II, right. way before I ever aspired to becoming a musician, but just always being a, a fan of music. And I remember that record as being something that was just really, really cool, you know, a whole lot of love and heartbreaker and all that stuff and that sound. So when I, uh, you know, as I got to be a little bit older, you know, I started seeing from an aesthetic point of view, the Les Paul was just a cool, sexy looking guitar. Right. So when I actually started playing, I was naturally drawn to Les Paul and it turned out that that whole lot of love was played on that guitar. So there was different things all pointing in the same direction. And uh, I just felt really comfortable on a, on a Les Paul sonically and aesthetically and all that. Now the cool thing is that like, if, if I go to Sweetwater website right now and I type in slash, I get see there was... a guy standing against a wall with his pants down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I see that. And then I see a bunch of products with your name on it. And the cool thing about you is like, like right now, there are six Les Pauls that we offer, one of which was a lefty, thank you very much, an appetite, which is great. Two J45s, a signature double neck, of course, your Dunlop Wah, two flavors thereof, the Octave Fuzz, and your Seymour Duncan pickups as well as well in black or zebra. Should I gotta come down there and check that out? <laughs> no, you should, man. There's a lot of stuff. But the cool thing is you walk your talk or play what you have your name on. It's not like you're, you're 
you're putting your name on something you don't play. Like you are, you are Mr. Les Paul, Mr. Wawa, Mr. Marshall, Mr. You know, just, humbuckers. I, yeah, I'm just fortunate fortunate uh, enough to be able to work with these really great companies to get them to build stuff for me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And then, and then, you know, I guess what happens is, you know, they, they I, I, uh, you know, with with Gibson and with Seymour Duncan and, and Dunlop and all, they've all, they're all products that I bought from them. You know, and finally got to a point where they decided they wanted to give me signature versions of what it is that I do with their stuff that I bought. Cool. Do you yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah, so no, it's, it's great. It's, it's really cool, but it's totally self-serving. It's it's not because you know I want to get products out there to make a bunch of money, and it's not really a money maker anyway. You know, not right. for me personally. So so it's really um, to me, it's just flattering to have something that I use that they'll put my name on and put it out there, and somebody might take a chance on it and buy it. You know. Yeah, I, I must say one of the things that some people watching this might not know, but I I know because I've been there, watched it happen, seen the money change hands. Is that even though you're arguably one of the biggest names on the Gibson roster. You've bought several Les Pauls from Sweetwater in the, over the last few them. years just because you like them. So I guess yeah. you're hooked, my friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a, I'm, I'm a, a little bit of a junkie, you know, and I, <laughs> I might need to seek help on that. But <laughs> like, yeah. as addictions go, that's a pretty healthy one. It though. could be worse, yeah. yeah. It could be a lot it worse. Been, you know. And your latest one, Vic, the the Victoria Gold Top. Tell me a little bit about how that one was sported, because that's a beauty, including the fifties neck, the maple top with the mahogany body. What, where was that born out of? Well, I mean, in the in the late, uh, let's see, I guess in the late nineteen eighty nine, late eighties, early nineties, I had a gold top that I got from Gibson. That was one of those, uh, you know, uh, what do they call it, uh, a store second or right. something. And they gave it to me and it just had this really great rich sound. So live from that point on, I used it for um, all the songs that had solos that were like long, sustaining single note kind of thing. So uh, from Sweet Child of Mine to November Rain and, and Strange right. and Heaven's Door and all that, you know. And uh, at some point um, during my early, during Snake Pit days, my house got robbed and I got all the guitars that I had in my studio because the studio was in my house. Right. All those guitars got ripped off. And uh, and I managed to get them all back, but the one guitar that I didn't get back was the gold top. And so, you know, I've been using gold tops ever since, but I, doing this signature model with Gibson, um, I wanted to do basically the exact same guitar as that one that got stolen, which was a dark back 57 reissue type thing. Although back then in 1989, it wasn't called a reissue. Right. <laughs> they didn't have reissues then, but it was a dark back gold top 57 style. Right. And so, so this particular one is designed after that. Which explains the neck profile right off the right. bat. And the cool. name Victoria. Yeah, exactly. And the name Victoria goes because I, I found out subsequently you know years later that the person that was responsible for the theft was named victoria so <laughs> oh, oh so this is you saying you can't have this one yeah, allegedly right. exactly. <laughs> and one of the things that fascinates me too and I, like this just funny enough when you like you mentioned page earlier and les paul so this is the brand new issue of guitar world oh, and cool. if i with jimmy on the front with les paul but when i turn it to this next page i see this and this is really, really cool, in my humble opinion. I spoke to the guys at Ernie Ball today. Unfortunately, I wanted, to, I wanted to hold the real thing up, but we haven't got them in yet. We've already sold over 100, by the way, sight unseen. Yeah. But it's three of your sets in a tin. And according to the guys at Ernie Ball, which, once again, I guess this is something you've earned, you're the first guy ever to have an Ernie Ball signature package actually available to the public. Apparently before you, the only other guy who had one was Keith Richards and he he just gets five string sets and that's it. So you not right. only have your own damn set, you've got a tin. In fact, I jokingly said, oh, this is cool. I can get a cool slash tin and they give me strings as well. Nice. Because I, I want the I want the tin. But the gauges are unusual. It's 11, 14, 18 plane and then 3 8, 28, 38, 48. Is that yeah. a, a set you've always used? Because that's kind of heavy. That's I've been using 11s uh, since, yeah, the, the I guess the mid 80s. I mean, I started out, you know, like most guys were, I think, nines. Right, and the slinkies. That was just too light for me, just because of the way that I play. 
And so I went to 10s and that didn't work. And I finally went to 11s and it, and it worked great. And then I adjusted the lower strings um, to a lighter gauge only because what happens is when you start to use a lot of saturation and you've got these big, heavy strings, they just become muddy. Right. Um, and and I, that was that was a problem. So over the years, I finally got to a place where the low strings were just light enough to be to have clarity at a high gain level. And, and I had the, the density I needed for the high strings. Gotcha. So you're the normally it's skinny top, heavy bottom. You're fat top, skinny bottom, I guess. Yeah. Something the, like that. Yeah. Whatever. It's, it's, I haven't, I'm dying to try them actually. It's regular size bottom. <laughs> <laughs> and there right. you have it. So, right. yeah, and Ernie Ball is great. And, you know, I didn't mention them earlier, but that's, that's a company that I've been with since the beginning of my uh, career as well. And they've always been super, super supportive. And we've gone, we've, we've experimented with a lot of different types of strings, you know, right. um, and uh, titanium and this and that and the other. And we've, we finally arrived at this place with the strings that we're at now. And then they decided they wanted to do the signature thing, which I think I'm the first guinea pig. I think there's other guys lined up after me that are going to have gotcha. a similar a rollout. So, so, so you're Mr. Sink or Swim then? Yeah. <laughs> well, I would, I would say, judging by the fact there's been no ads and we've sold over 100 just because people typed, I guess, typed in Slash and saw that went by. I guess yeah, you have, I you have to a good have, start. I put something on my Instagram too when they first gave me the artwork. Um, ah. But it's cool. The 10 is great. You get three packs of strings, which you could basically buy in a store, but you get this presentation. And the 10 is great because who doesn't like a little empty box that you can put shit in? Exactly. You know? Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's, definitely what, that's definitely what I want when, when it's all said and done. Now, talking of. Um, strings and stuff is like a lot of people that will they'll talk a lot about the guitar quite a lot about pickups not so much about the amp but more so nowadays than ever but strings and picks rarely get the attention they deserve and they're both pretty critical because they're right at the source of the sound how much time have you put you've obviously put a lot of time in with regards you know getting the like the right flavor from from your friends at any ball how, how particular are you with regards picks as well because that's literally where the where, where your brain contacts the strings I think I experimented with picks. I mean, I always looked for the heaviest picks. And I remember even back when I worked in a guitar store, you know, the, the heaviest uh, picks that we carried is what I went for. Um, and, and I, you know, and there was a choice in the store that I could pick from to really get sort of experiment with heavy picks. And I, I ended up um, arriving at the Tortex picks just because someone I met somewhere had one and it was the 1.0.4, 1.04, whatever that purple gauge is. Right. And, and that turned out to be the heaviest pick and, and, and also just a regular shape, you know, guitar pick, uh, plectrum style kind of thing. Right. <laughs> um, and, and it was the heaviest one and I stick, I've stuck with those ever since. And I haven't really, you know, uh, even looked at anything else. Yeah, because they've got really, really thick now. But you, have you ever experimented with those ridiculously brick-sized ones, or you just stick with um, what I've, you know? I've, I've, people have given me some crazy, some crazy picks that are made out of different kinds of materials or metals or this or that or the other, and they're interesting. But really, when it comes down to everyday playing, or if I was to walk out on stage, I would feel really vulnerable with one, any one of these picks trying to get, execute anything properly with it. So I just feel comfortable with the picks that I've been using that I get from Dunlop and, and that's that. Gotcha. And, and, and the same applies to the lighter gauges. So lighter, you, you feel vulnerable as well. I, they just don't hold up. I, I, for, I, compared to most people, I'm a really hard hitting player. Right. And I can't use anything uh, lighter really than what I'm using. They flex too much or they just fall to pieces. Gotcha. No <laughs> I was going to say good. To, good. <laughs> There's a song title right there. But anyway, right. Um, uh, talking of your playing, I have two more questions if you don't mind, because it's fascinating. So I've always wanted to ask you this, and I always forget. And I'm going to grab this because this, to my knowledge, is the only lefty version of the. And I've just pulled my earphone out because I suck. Whenever I watch you play, when it comes to solos, a lot of the time you have the neck like literally pointing up to the sky. Okay. What is the rationale behind that? Does it is it ease of is it the hand position or the the access to the neck or both or just because it looks cool? Um, no, it's something. It's not because it looks cool. It's something that 
ha started it just sort of happened and I didn't even realize that I've gotten into this thing but it's it's really to access the higher notes right um, and it's also gives you access to the higher to the higher strings as well so like because you know I play most of the time all my rhythm stuff is with with the guitar down in my knees right yeah it's and, low yeah when you're trying to execute stuff on the top three strings higher up the neck, it just sort of naturally started picking it up and getting closer to it, you know? And I, I didn't realize that until you start seeing pictures of yourself and you go, oh, that's like a thing, I guess. Yeah, no, it, it, ergonomically, it makes sense, though. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I was wondering exactly how that happened, and that's that's basically what it is. And, I mean, I do that when I'm when I'm in the studio and I do it. Uh, in one case, I was I was playing yesterday, and I realized I do it when I'm sitting down. Too, oh, you know? really? Okay, so it's so so it's it's twenty four seven, literally. Yeah, yeah. It's just your natural thing is vert verticalize the neck. Yeah, so now yeah. I know. The other thing is like your your woman tone, like you know your neck pickup sometimes with the tone rolled off. Woman tone. Oh, I like that. Yeah, that's I think Clapton coined it, or people coined it over Clapton's sound. Really? Uh, that's cool. Um, where did that come from? Was that just experimentation? Because a lot of people will, will flick to the neck pickup a lot, but you roll your tone off as well sometimes. When, yeah. when do you decide to do that and how? When, um, how, why, what? Well, I, I definitely use the rhythm pickup for that tone that, that it has. Right. And I think, you, you know, what it was, was I had a guitar, um, I think it was a, a, 50, a 58 Explorer okay. that I had in the early 90s. And when I used the rhythm pickup, it had that tone without touching the, the, the tone knobs. And uh -huh. so when I started playing live, um, those particular songs that I recorded with that guitar, I found that if I, I couldn't get that kind of sweet, creamy thing um, unless I turned the tone down and all of a sudden there it was. Uh -huh. and, and I, so on the Les Paul. So that's, that's really where that came from, just sort of trial and error to get a, a particular sound that I wanted. Right, so it was born of a guitar you didn't have to do that with, and then the only way to replicate yeah. it was by doing yeah. that. Yeah. Oh, interesting. The other thing I've got to that, ask you... That floor is the only one without adjusting the, the tone that does that by itself. Interesting. Yeah, I didn't know that either. Cool. One last playing question, if you don't mind. I, I have the honour, and I may guess because people are stupid, but I teach here at Sweetwater in the evenings. I know that. And I, I, I have a lot of uh, pupils who want to learn Slash stuff. So I've accumulated some books over there, and I got this one recently. And the guy does a great job analyzing your soloing stuff, but he's getting into great detail about he's going from the major to the minor to the harmonic minor to the melodic minor to the natural minor to the mixolydian to the jackalydian, whatever. Do you actually think in terms of scales and whatnot when you're playing, or does it just come from here? No. Um, I have a hard time thinking. <laughs> I play. Um, really, it's 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 uh, distracting for me to try and think while I'm playing. So, trying to trying to uh, recognize certain scales would, is virtually impossible. Um, but, you know, but I, I I can appreciate that there's something different about a half tone here and a whatever right. you know, and I know it's not your. It doesn't fall into a, a typical scale, right? Um, but yeah, that's it's it's really an uh, it's something that you go for just by ear, you know, just that you want that half step there, or that whole step. You gotcha, I mean? gotcha. Yeah, so so it basically goes from here to here, as opposed to like it's like like you're not just regurgitating a box pattern or muscle memory. You actually think you are kind of thinking, I guess. Then, well, I mean, yeah, I, I think what happens is you just. He tried to, when you're improvising, you know, you're trying to be spontaneously go from what you hear in your head to, to out through your fingers instantaneously. Right. And that's, that's a lifelong journey. I'll be trying to do that properly for the rest of my days. Right. Gotcha. But, you know, that's really where, what you're doing is you're trying to get better and better and better at being able to hear something in your head and instantaneously execute it on the fingerboard. And so if you hear that certain kind of note that's not in your sort of typical sort of scale pattern, um, it's not really important what it is. It's just being able to, you know, to be able to describe it, it's just to be able to put your finger on it and know what it sounds like. Gotcha, gotcha. Now, what would your advice be to a young guy who would, or a young girl who would like to be able to, or an older guy or girl who would like to be able to do that? Is there, are there any tricks, are there any hacks, or is it just persistence? It's, it's really just about whatever it is that you're trying to do, being patient enough to keep working at it, uh, to be able to do it 
where it just becomes as second nature as possible. And like I said, it's a lifelong journey, but the more you do it, the better at it you get. And over time, you'll get to a place where, where you can hear something and, and go for it and make it happen while you're improvising, you know, and actually um, arrive at the note that you want to hear. You know what I'm saying? No, and, and no, that just, makes sense. So you just have to go for what it is that you want to, that you want to hear. And does the same apply to riff writing as well? Yeah, I mean, it applies to anything, really, when it comes to music, is to be able to have an idea melodically in your head, um, you know, and, and to be able to, to execute it. So it could be a riff, it could be chord changes, it could be notes within a chord. You gotcha, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. A chord. I mean, it's really all about um, making the music you want to hear. So, like, to, to, so, sorry, one more. I'd lie to you because that's like three questions out of one. I already got one more in this one. Um, the um, so, if you're writing a song and, and you hear something in your head, will there be a time when you actually stop and you'll experiment, like mess around until you find it? Yeah, yeah, and all the time. I mean, like I, you know, uh, when I'm sitting around the house playing guitar, you know, I'm listening for stuff uh, all the time, and then and 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 it's it is something that I, I recognize that when I can. Or even if I'm playing along, say, to, to music that's on the TV or music uh, on the radio or whatever it is, is to be able to know what a note is uh, before, you know, to be able to, to uh, it, you know, it's, it's hard to explain. But, you know, to find a note without actually having to play up and down the neck to find it, to be able to just know where it is instinctively, just because you're been doing this so much that you sort of know that this is a half step up or this is a full step up or is this a third up or whatever it is um, to know what that sounds like just looking at the fingerboard. Gotcha. Got So it's it's like muscle memory, but involving the brain a little. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, when you ask me, I find it's really hard to to verbally describe. But, you know, I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on when you're just sitting around playing and writing and discovering and all that. And then what happens is when you go out and play live, all those hours that you spent, you know, jamming and writing at home or whatever starts to come out um, more and more spontaneously when you're playing live. You know? That makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Oh, before you go, one thing. I heard it down the grapevine that maybe there will be some more Epiphones coming down the path that might be released at NAM. Pray yeah. tell more, my friend. Pray tell more. What's the skinny um, then? Well, I did I did a, a handful of Gibson Les Paul signature models. Um, I think there's one, two, three, four, uh, five of them. Yeah, five um, or six. Yeah, six, six with the gold top. Yep. So, um, what we did was we did uh, six identical Epiphone models of the same, same colors and same, uh, uh, you know, basic basic uh, ideas and and uh, all that. So uh, specifics on the on the Les Pauls are are basically emulated on the on the Epiphones, but they're a little bit less expensive. So those are coming out and those are really, really cool. I gotta say it makes me really happy when we do uh, a, an Epiphone that the quality is as close to a Gibson as, as, as you're gonna get and they're affordable. So it's really makes me happy to see those and they play and sound really great. Yeah, I must say like, I, I love this guitar and I recently, I recently acquired the sit their 60s reissue inspired mm -hmm. by Gibson Epiphone and it's great. So so basically I can get a, an affordable Victoria that hopefully won't get stolen by her. Yeah. <laughs> or by her by her thugs. That's <laughs> by her cheap thugs, yeah, her low yeah, lights. No, I, yeah. I met one of them. I, yeah. Oh wow, okay. Uh, yeah, I caught him we caught him and then I, I went to I had to identify him and all that. So anyway, but uh <laughs> yeah, you'll be able to go into a store, buy one, and then just keep it under lock and key and hopefully what happened to me won't happen to you. <laughs> so at this point, my friend, I know you're in the studio, you're about to do some work that everyone wants to hear, so I'm gonna stop taking your time. Thank you very much for giving it to me though and us and hopefully next time I see you, which I said seven months ago we won't be confined to wearing masks and social distancing, all that good stuff. Yeah, well, you know, all things considered, I mean, I, I, I got, I'm praying that we're sort of going towards the dissipation of all this, so we'll see what happens. Let's hope so. In the meantime, thank you so much and stay safe, my friend, stay safe. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's good to see you and I'm glad we got a chance to hang out for a second and I will see you again soon. Great, take care. Right. Cheers. Bye.